Our next speaker is Professor Adrian Keene from Brown University, who will speak on Navajo flasks and hipster headdresses. Hello, everyone. Um, so I brought my stopwatch up here because, as natives know, don't give a native a microphone. Uh, we will talk forever. So, Sio uh, Nagata, um, I am Adrian Keen. I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, and I am currently an assistant professor at Brown University. And I can't tell you how surreal it is to be standing up here. In 11 or 12 years ago, I was an intern here at the museum. Um, <laughs> So I spent the summer with Leonda Lovechuk in, hello, <laughs> uh, in public affairs and so attended many, many events in this space. So it's so amazing to um, be up here and I'm so honored to be a part of all of this. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my work that I do around stereotypes of Native peoples. Um, and the title I gave for my talk was a very long and very typical uh, Dr. Keene title that has lots of words in it. But um, a few days ago, something happened, and it made me switch up um, everything that I was going to talk about. And I switched up everything because the Army Corps of Engineers decided to grant the easement, the final easement for the Dakota Access Pipeline. And so I felt like I couldn't stand up here in front of you and talk about stereotypes without talking about DAPL. So I'm going to do that um, for you a little bit today. <clears throat> So to begin, um, I always start with this image. Um, and this is an image that I use in all of my presentations because I find it so incredibly striking. This is what happens when you Google image search Native American. And I think it's so important to look at because it encapsulates so much of what we face as Native people. So I, as I said, I'm an academic, but I come at this topic as not an academic, but as a white passing suburban Cherokee who is constantly faced with affronts to her culture. So these are the kind of things that I am faced with every single day. These are the kind of ideas that people have about who I am as a Native person. And what I think is so striking about this image um, are a few things. The first is that the majority of these photos are all photos that are set in the historic past. They are sepia toned, they are black and white, um, they are drawings or paintings um, from history. So they don't represent the modernity of Native cultures. Uh, they also are mostly men. Um, as you can tell, and that uh, completely erases the presence of Native women. And then lastly, the majority of these photos are images of men in headdresses, of plains cultures. And there are 567 plus federally recognized tribes in the US, hundreds more state recognized and non-federally um, recognized tribes, and that diversity is in no way represented by this image on the screen. And so I know when I'm doing my writing and giving talks that this is what people are starting with. Um, this is what folks think of when they think of Native peoples. And that's a really big problem. And so uh, I'm a blogger. I will talk a little bit about um, my blog that I write called Native Appropriations. But um, I started the blog when I was in graduate school. And I started it uh, because I was so inundated with these images um, out on the East Coast and had a really hard time reconciling uh, the fact that I was a Native person, that my classmates didn't know I was a Native person, and that the only images they ever saw were things like this. So uh, back in 2010 when I started the blog was kind of the first resurgence of um, the tribal trends in fashion. So this is a sacred headdress on a skull on a hipster. Um, <laughs> Lego minifigure, uh, sexy Native American Indian costume. The description of this says, play Pocahontas in this sexy Native American Indian costume and John Smith might give back Manhattan. Put the wow in powwow and party on. <laughs> Incredibly respectful. Um, Stanford Indians, I write a lot about Indian mascots. Um, I was so blown away by the symposium that was held here um, about mascots specifically. I went to Stanford undergrad, so we were the Indians until 1971. It was changed due to student activism, but it was something that constantly popped up. Cherokee red soda, if you learn one thing, uh, well, I guess two things, that's not how you spell Cherokee, and uh, <laughs> We also never in the history of ever have worn headdresses like that. So 
uh, fire water, whiskey, and bourbon, a uh, teepee for your cat, baking powder, there's an iPhone game called Crazy Dentist. Um, Eskimo Joe's is a restaurant chain in Oklahoma. This one hits close to home as a Cherokee person. This is Trail of Tears Fireworks. Yeah, uh, someone sent me this image a few years ago and um, it's still for sale. Uh, you can find it on, online and um, it was being sold in Connecticut. Um, I write a lot about fashion and people tend to think of fashion as being kind of a, a frivolous thing that doesn't have deep roots. Um, but uh, this is an image of Bethany Yellowtail's dress um, there that comes from her family's Crow and Northern Cheyenne beadwork designs. And the other image is Marjan Pajoski for a brand called T KTZ who just straight up stole it. Um, and those designs have meaning, have power, have relationships for her family, and it was something that um, he didn't even regard in that process. Um, Ralph Lauren also had uh, the winter catalog of cultural appropriation where he used images of native peoples to sell his clothing. Um, and then I wanted to end the, the pictures with this image because this is something here in DC that is everywhere. And so these are the images that become totally normalized. We don't even stop to think about them because we see them so much. And so the question I'm constantly faced with, with this blog is, what does this mean in terms of the ways we as Native people are treated? And I use this image, this GIF, that shows the dramatic loss of land that Native people experienced um, in a very short period of time. It's rapid when you look at those dates across the top. And in order to justify that dramatic loss of land and the dramatic loss of life that accompanied it, uh, the, the colonizer had to paint us as Native people as inferior, as savage, as unworthy of land, unworthy of life. And that is the spirit that pervades um, everything that happens to us as Native people moving forward. Um, and so I have this blog where I write about all of these issues. Um, I also am very active on Twitter. So I have seen how having these conversations on kind of a public platform, um, condensing things into 140 characters, shout out to all my Twitter followers who are watching on the live stream, um, is a really interesting way of engaging this, of really challenging people on that kind of minute day-to-day -day sort of level. So the biggest question I get all of the time from all sorts of friendly people on the internet um, is, <laughs> don't you have bigger issues to, to worry about? And so um, in the last bit of my presentation, I wanna make the case that yes, these representations truly deeply matter, um, specifically in the fight against Dakota Access Pipeline and in the current immigration debates. So this is an image of Ocheti Shikoi camp um, out on the, the plains in North Dakota. Um, I was able to go out to uh, the camps twice um, in September and in November uh, to support the movement and be a part of things there. My time there pales in comparison to many people. It was a short um, bit of time, but I have such fond memories of being there, of this incredibly beautiful place, of time spent around um, the main sacred fire where people were singing and laughing and dancing, and um, it was just a really incredible space to be in and contrast those beautiful memories that I have of a peaceful, prayerful, powerful place with these ideas. So I have some quotes from the New York Times. Um, so the New York Times did an article called uh, Neighbors Say North Dakota Pipeline Protests Disrupt Lives and Livelihoods. So they interviewed neighbors of the Ocheti Shikoi camp to ask them about what they felt about all of these folks camped out nearby. Uh, this first quote says, you get 2,000, 3,000 natives together. Is that safe? Uh, Mr. Schaff asks as he mowed the grass outside a home he and his son are building next to a cornfield about 10 miles north of camp. Uh, they've been somewhat threatened by this. A Morton County commissioner and part-time rancher who raises horses and chickens. These ranchers, it's their livelihood. If somebody would come and set fire to their hay reserves and come and cut their fences and cause their livestock to get loose, that causes real problems. Law enforcement in the area confirmed uh, that work at several construction sites near St. Anthony had stopped and workers were evacuated. This was when there was a, um, a direct action happening miles away from there. Um, in addition, Little Heart Elementary School was placed on lockdown, which an official at the school said had become fairly common. 
And then lastly, when Jared Ernst heads out to work in his fields, he's carrying an extra piece of equipment. I've been carrying a sidearm on me everywhere I go. I have a small revolver that I carry. My wife has started carrying. A bunch of neighbors have started carrying firearms in their vehicles. I think there are some that are carrying on them uh, like I am. You just don't know, said Ernst. Ernst said his decision to arm himself stems from an incident that occurred when he said Dakota Access Pipeline protesters drove through his alfalfa field to unload a trailer of horses. Ernst says the confrontation ended without incident, but now he's erring on the side of caution. So to me, this collection of quotes just says that there is such a fear of a collective of Native peoples that we're still so steeped in these stereotypes of us being savage, of us being wild, of us uh, coming to burn the hay. What does that even mean? That's straight out of the Hollywood Westerns that Jesse's going to talk about. And so this is what leads to things like this. The police brutality that has been experienced by the protectors at Standing Rock is unlike anything that I have ever seen. Um, I uh, watched on the live streams on October 27th as the North Treaty Camp was torn down. And uh, this is Natani Means, who is a, um, a rapper, an activist, uh, incredible. Um, I watched as he was being beaten by uh, Morton County Police. I see the images even now of the police in full riot gear and full militarized gear lined up to meet unarmed protectors who are there without any weapons, but because we as Native people are so, believe, are so steeped in these stereotypes, this is the response that we're met with. That of course, a gathering of Native people can't be peaceful and prayerful. It ultimately is inherently violent just by the fact that we are Native people. And so as I watched um, the violence that was happening on October 27th, that was the same time that the World Series was happening. So I'm sitting there watching these live streams. I'm live tweeting what's going on. I am panicking. I am seeing my friends get pepper sprayed and shot with rubber bullets. And then I'm seeing on my social media streams people dressed up for the World Series. And so how can we separate these things? How can we say that Native people are respected by these mascot images when these two images can be occurring simultaneously? And then, four days later, Halloween. And for Halloween, people in North Dakota dressed up as water protectors. And um, I don't know if you can see the, um, the one couple, they have signs that say water is life and no dapple. They're holding alcohol. They're wearing uh, fake, those Pocahati costumes that I showed. This other group um, has signs that say, Res respect our water, respect our land. I got a job, I'm a water protector, spelled wrong. And then the one on the bottom um, is a woman who I actually think thought she was being supportive um, and has a sign that says no dapple while wearing a stereotypical fake headdress and a big piece of turquoise. So clearly, uh, Native cultures are so disrespected, are so seen as lesser, that even when this massive um, uprising of Native peoples, a collective of coming together to protect the water for everybody, not just for a Native community, were met with this. Then also that week, a, a high school football team um, had, was playing an opponent that had an Indian mascot, and they made a sign that said, hey, Indians, get ready for a Trail of Tears Part 2. Also, this was all in one week. This was all um, happening simultaneously. So all of these are connected to me. There's no way to separate out the blatant disrespect that we have for Native lands, for Native rights to land, um, for uh, the police brutality at Standing Rock from these images that paint native, that dehumanize native people, that paint us as less than. And so in the last minute, I wanted to talk about the other side of that, which is complete and total erasure. So those images I showed you at the beginning paint native people as historically in the past or as extinct. And these images continue that process, that stereotype that we're no longer here. And it's really important for us to acknowledge the past of this country of immigration being a foundation of the way that we got here. But it's also a problem to equate immigration with violent colonization. And that's kind of what has been happening in a lot of the narratives of the immigration debates. So we see all these signs that say we're all immigrants, but we're not all immigrants. Those of us who are native have been here since time immemorial. Those of us who are descendants from slaves were brought here against our will. We're not all immigrants. <laughs> 
And then I've been seen at these rallies or Lady Gaga standing up at the Super Bowl and singing out those first lines of this land is your land. And I know Woody Guthrie wrote the song as a socialist critique on uh, Amer or, uh, God Bless America. But uh, most folks today don't know that and only know the happy uh, Boy Scout version of it. Um, but hearing settlers say, this land is your land, this land is my land, this land was made for you and me, is a complete and total erasure of Native people um, on whose lands you stand today. So um, Native people have been kind of taking back that narrative, um, starting to use this hashtag, no ban on stolen land. Um, that's Nick Estes and um, Melanie Yazzie, um, who uh, have those signs. That's me and my colleague Liz Hoover on the other side. And so to me, this is a step forward. This is a way of being intersectional, of thinking about acknowledging the illegality, the horribleness of the immigrant ban, but also acknowledging the fact that we are here on native land, um, that we're here on indigenous stolen land. So I will end with that, um, but I look forward to having more conversations and I'm happy to talk about fashion and uh, things in the Q&A as well, but wado, thank you. So it sounds as though, in addition to our hashtag stereotypes, we have a hashtag no ban on stolen land going. <laughs>